The Move to Amend is a nationwide grassroots organization dedicated to amending the U.S. Constitution so that it says two things clearly and unequivocally. First, that rights rec recognized under the Constitution belong to natural human beings only, period. No corporations, no labor unions, natural human beings. The other thing uh, is that it should say that money is not speech. That way uh, we can and should regulate political contributions and political spending. Move to Amend is very happy to be back here at the Mercury Cafe. And before I get, go any further in this presentation, I would like to uh, take a moment to say thank you to the Mercury Cafe's owner, Marilyn McGinnity. Round of applause, please. <laughs> Marilyn and the Mercury and the Mercury staff have been ground zero for all things progressive in Denver for as long as I have been here. And I've been here since the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, I know that this year is the Mercury's 24th anniversary in this particular space. And uh, that will be on Halloween, fittingly enough. Uh, so again, a big round of applause for Marilyn and for the Mercury. I also wanted to take a moment to say uh, uh, hello and to introduce uh, some guests that we have in the crowd tonight. First, we have uh, Shimako Noble from Oakland, California. Shimako is the co-founder and executive director of Hip Hop Congress. Hip, -co Hip Hop Congress is a partner organization of Move to Amend, and we were happy to have Shimako and others in town for a conference this weekend called What the Bleep Happened to Hip Hop, which focused on how the corporate entertainment industry co-opted and commodified uh, hip hop music and hip hop culture in America, and how Hip Hop Congress and Move to Amend can work together to reintroduce the ideas of small d democracy uh, to our respective groups and to American society in general. So, welcome, Shimako. I also wanted to, uh, to give a shout out to Jason Bosch. Jason, uh, as most of you probably know, uh, is the founder of Denver's uh, Multimedia Human Rights Film Festival, Argus, film, Argus Fests, which presents right here at, at the Mercury on Thursday nights and uh, also at Mutiny Books on Broadways on Tuesday nights. Uh, Jason has actually uh, offered to videotape this presentation for us tonight. So welcome and thank you, Jason. The uh, topic of tonight's conversation is corporations are not people reclaiming democracy from big money and global corporations. And I think that's especially important to talk about right now. Uh, we're in the middle of a hotly contested uh, political race and corporate personhood and money and speech, whether we like it or not, and I know I don't, uh, is making its uh, presence very apparent in this political campaign season. Uh, anybody within hearing distance of a radio, viewing distance of a TV, a keystroke distance of a computer internet connection uh, knows that there's a deluge of money that is buying advertising space in every conceivable place that they can cram an adver advertisement about po politics and it is as uh, irritating as it is unavoidable and not only that it is, is truly uh, putting um, causing people to check out from the elections. And I think that's a terrible thing. And that's one of the things that uh, we're here to talk about tonight. Um, and I'm especially happy that we're here talking about corporate constitutional rights. Corporations are not people. Because as serious as the money problem in politics is, it's not the only existential threat that we face in this country today. Um, our small d, small r democratic republic is under siege by two problems, money in politics and corporate constitutional rights. And the perfect example 
of the connection of those two problems comes in Prop 105, which is on the ballot in Colorado this year. Uh, the Yes on Prop 105 campaign uh, is currently involved in the money is not speech part of the battle. And quite frankly, they're getting their butts handed to them right now, money-wise, because Monsanto and Pepsi-Cola and the Grocers Association and all of the other big agribusiness companies that have lined up against Prop 105 are outspending the yes on Prop 105 forces 20 to 1. 20 to 1. They, the corporations have spent $20 million to yes on Prop 105's $1 million. What these companies are doing in a very blatant fashion is they're attempting to buy our election. They're spending $20 million to put out confusing advertising in the hopes of getting people to recognize or getting people to believe that knowing what's in our food is a bad idea. And it's just not a bad idea. It's a good common sense regulation and good common sense tells reasonable people that we should have a right to know what's in our food. But corporations don't want that. Here's why it's both problems. Because even if we win, even when we do win on Prop 105, the very first thing that the Grocers Association and Monsanto and Pepsi-Cola are going to do is they're going to go to court, federal court in Denver, and they're going to argue that the new law, which requires them to speak, is a violation of their the corporation's inalienable constitutional rights. So even if we win, even when we win on Prop 105, the fight is not over. And we know that's what they're going to do because that's exactly what they've done in Vermont, where last election in 2012, Vermont passed a GMO labeling law, and that is now in court, and I'm sure Jeff and David will both have things to say about that today. So it's not as simple as getting the money out of politics because that aspect of the problem, the corporate constitutional rights that allows corporations to uh, veto reasonable regulations has nothing to do with money in politics. We have some very distinguished guests here today uh, who will be introduced in a moment uh, to develop the ideas that I've already talked about and more uh, what we the people can do to reclaim the political power that's been taken from us by the Supreme Court and given to corporations who were never intended to have it. Now, we're not having a debate here today because our guests aren't on opposite sides of the uh, issue. It's more of a discussion between friends, uh, political allies, uh, who might have different takes, different ideas about what they both recognize to be the problem. As an aside, if you want to see a good debate on the issue. In September, David uh, had a debate with James Bopp, the attorney for Citizens United, Inc. at Indiana University. It's online. I'd encourage you to go out and look at it and watch it. David quite literally um, kicked his ass. Can I say that? Yeah, he yes, did. It he was did. Uh, it was a, a great debate performance by David, Mr. Bopp. Uh, didn't, quite frankly, didn't acquit himself very well. Um, tonight our format, again, is going to be a conversation between friends. I'm going to ask uh, a member of the crowd from Metro Denver Move to Amend to come up and introduce each of our guests. Uh, then our guests are going to give a 10 to 15, 15 minute presentation, uh, their thoughts on the issue. After that, uh, I'm going to give them the opportunity to uh, respond or comment on what the others, the, each other, what they have said. Uh, after that, I have a couple of questions that I would like to ask. And then uh, we're going to open up the, uh, the evening and the microphone for, um, for you all to ask the questions that you have. You see we have a stand-up microphone here. Uh, if you have questions that you would like to ask, uh, we do have a sign-up sheet for questions. At the, uh, at the information table. 
I would ask that you sign up on that sheet, uh, and then when we get to the question portion of the evening, uh, I will call people up four at a time to the microphone, and then when we get to one person left in line, then I'll call up the other four. That way we can have some orderly questions. So if you'd like to ask a question, please do sign up. Um, and after we're done, after we've uh, talked the issue through, um, there will be time for you all to uh, go and purchase Mr. Clements' book. Uh, I would absolutely encourage you to read uh, Jeff Clements' Corporations Are Not People. If you haven't already, it, it is, uh, quite frankly, an excellent book. Uh, when I give a presentation on Move to Amend uh, to groups, I say, if you want to understand corporate constitutional rights, the problems that they raise, and how we fix it, you have to read two books. You have to read Tom Hartman's Unequal Protection, and you have to read Jeff Clements' Corporations Are Not People. It's just one of the standard texts uh, on the topic. Yeah, I would, I would applaud for that, too. <laughs> so, without further ado, it's my honor to introduce a Metro Denver Move to Amend member, Hannah Weston. Hannah uh, was a practicing lawyer and a partner in the law firm of Nadler and Weston from 1984 to 2005 and she was on the National Board of the American Civil Liberties Union from 1974 to 1980. Hannah, welcome. I'm not going to take very long because Steve told us to leave the microphone. It should be on. Hannah, you need to turn the mic or speak into it. It's just pointing this way to the audience. Thanks, Jason. Okay. Okay. I am, have the pleasure of introducing Jeff Clements, about whom I've heard for a very long time, and I have to admit I haven't bought the book until now, and I did buy the book now. <laughs> Jeff, is a, Jeff is the chair of the National Board of the Free Speech for People organization. He co-founded that organization in 2009, after he had represented organizations who were interested in the issue in Citizens United. Is that true? You filed... No, that was all true. <laughs> but you filed an amicus brief in Citizens United, and they didn't listen to you. They, they, they persuaded four of them. You did. <laughs> that, was, that didn't, quite, didn't quite do it. In addition to being president of that organization, Jeff has written a book which we're going to see now. And in addition to that, the history of Jeff as Assistant Attorney General in Massachusetts would send you up the wall. Civil rights, civil liberty, environment, self, uh, consumer rights, and many other things. And currently now, in addition to this organization, he's spending lots of time on environmental things. I want to hear what he has to say, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> That's too much. Thank you, Hannah, so much. Uh, and, and thank you, Steve, and the Mercury Cafe, Move to Amend, my friend David Cobb. Um, you know, I, uh, and thanks to all of you for being here and all of the work I know you're doing for our democracy. Um, I did file a brief in Citizens United, uh, and um, I guess I'll just start, start there, uh, because I had left the Attorney General's office in Massachusetts in um, 2009, uh, returning to private practice of law, and uh, I, you know, like a lot of um, not only lawyers but citizens, I had experienced in my time both there and uh, you know, in the past 20 plus years of law practice, the kind of shrinking of our democracy, the shrinking space for the public interest uh, because of the growing use of misuse of our Constitution uh, for corporations to strike down our public interest laws and for the big money to dominate our politics and our elections. Uh, so shortly after leaving the office, the Supreme Court announced they're going to rehear arguments in a, at that time, rather obscure case called Citizens United 
versus Federal Election Commission. So I did a brief uh, because I had looked at what the briefs had been, and, and they were a lot of really good briefs about the problem of money and campaign finance laws and things like that. Um, and the case, remember, concerned a more recent law, the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, restriction on corporate and union spending. But what it really concerned was about a century of law where Americans have always known we've got to keep corporate money out of elections. So it was a, a law about uh, corporate spending in elections. That's what the court telegraphed clearly. They were ready to overturn under a theory of corporate rights. And most of the briefs were about campaign finance and money. And so I, I, I prepared a brief uh, making the argument, which I think is absolutely correct, and I know these folks do too, and I hope you do too, that corporations aren't actually uh, who we had in mind in the Constitution when it opens we the people of the United States. So I, was, um, I, I laid out the argument for why corporations don't actually have constitutional rights and then kind of sent it around hoping I might have a client or two who'd be willing to sign on. Because uh, I had a good brief, but I didn't actually have organizations that were ready to go to the Supreme Court with this. So I, it got circulated far and wide, apparently, because I got a call, the very first call, and there's this guy on the phone with this Texas accent. And he, he, says, uh, he says he was, ran for president. <laughs> he ran for president of the Green Party. And he was a lawyer, ran for the attorney general in Texas. And um, you know, he had this Texas accent, and he says, I'm doing Democracy Unlimited now. Just sounded fantastic, exactly the kind of guy I was hoping I would call. <laughs> but it doesn't usually happen that way. <laughs> they actually call. And uh, he says, I heard about your brief. And I, you know, with Democracy Unlimited, we'd love to sign on. This was fantastic, because I was beginning to worry it'd be you know, the brief of Jeff Clements and nobody else. Um, so of course, that was David Cobb. We hadn't known each other before that. But basically, his response was in, in Texas ease, hell yeah, I'll sign on. And so. Uh, he, he was the first one to bring his organization on board, the or move to amend, free speech for people, none of these things existed then, remember. Um, and so it is a particular pleasure to be here with David, uh, now almost five years later after Citizens United, as uh, Hannah painfully reminded us, we didn't win in that case. Um, but we are winning now. Uh, we are doing what David and I and Stephen and others thought was possible. That we knew what the court was going to do in Citizens United, but we also knew the American people would not stand for it if we could only carry this debate to the country. We would win. We, we know that. We know it now, because everywhere we carry this debate about do corporations have the rights of human beings in our Constitution? Is our politics really supposed to be, you know, whoever has more money gets the loudest voice? Um, no, and Americans know that. And so if we can build this around the country, we will win. We will overturn Citizens United. Um, and so that's what I'd like to um, talk about tonight briefly in my remaining time. Um, and uh, what I thought I'd, I'd do quickly is just sort of outline, you know, this is a new edition of the book. Um, it's 2014, it's just out. The original edition came out only two and a half, three years ago. And so, you know, some people say, well, why do you have a new edition? And, uh, my friends say, do we have to buy another one? We already bought one. <laughs> and, and the answer is yes, you have to buy another one. Um, and that's partly because, um, it's not because, you know, my son's here and my wife Nancy and we have three kids in college, but it's not because of that. Uh, it's because of, um, we're giving all the royalties to groups like Move to Amend and Free Speech for People who are doing this work, 100% of the royalties. So please, uh, yeah. So, so please buy the book, check it out, but mostly that'll help, but as you know, in the publishing business, author royalties are not what they once were, um, but, but it, it will help. But what I really hope, I was so glad to hear Stephen's um, kind praise for the book, but more importantly, that people are using it as a tool, um, because that's what it was intended for. It's for every organization, every person who wants to use this book as a tool. Um, and so the reason we have a new edition is twofold. One, really horrible stuff that we said is going to happen after Citizens United is happening. Um, you know, what Move to Amend said, what Free Speech for People said, what the book said, you know, this was a disaster. The first edition said how it happened, but we didn't yet have all the data that we now have, so I want to focus a bit on that. Um, but the second is more, is, is, is more hopeful, and that's 
the, how much we have done together to actually carry this fight forward, how much Americans are doing, which is inspiring. It inspires me um, what people are doing across the country um, for a constitutional amendment that will overturn Citizens United, for corporate law reform, uh, for big reforms in our campaign finance laws, all kinds of things where people are doing what Americans do when the chips are down. Um, so that's the second part of the book. And they're both really important. I think we have to understand both of them because we need to know how bad it is, of course, and I think Americans get that, but we also need what's harder to convince folks sometimes that we actually have the power, the ability, and the tools to fix this, to build a democracy that works for everyone, and that's what we're doing. So first, the bad news. Um, you know, we've had about 25, let me start with the two problems of Citizens United, as you know, and Move to Event knows more than anyone, I think, is, um, not only money in, in, in politics and unlimited spending by corporations and, and billionaires and some unions after the Citizens United decision, but the idea of corporate constitutional rights. So both problems. On the money, I think what the, I've tried to do in the book that I think isn't fully appreciated is not just the amount, about $25 billion since the Citizens United decision, local, state, federal elections, um, but the source of the money. And by that, I don't mean ideological source or corporate source, or you, I mean how few people are able to now participate in American politics because the source of the money is the money of unbelievably few powerful interests in this country. So that 25 billion, about 80% of political spending generally comes from about half a percent of Americans. Uh, one half of one percent participate to make up about 80% of political money. Um, the uh, problem of corporate money, you know, there's for times people were saying after Citizens United, well, it looks like corporations aren't really spending much in elections. You know, they're not really make, doing what, you heard that actually. And, and now we know that's not true. Um, what they're not doing is spending it openly because Americans hate it when they do. So they're hiding it, they're running it through front groups. And about two weeks ago, Unfortunately, this didn't end up in the book because it just happened. A coder at the Republican National Committee made a mistake and put on the public part of the Republican Governors Association a document they usually keep secret, which is basically the, you know, the pay list of the biggest corporations in the world to the National Governors Association, which of course runs it out into elections all over the country. And there was millions and millions of dollars and the list of corporations reads like the Fortune 500. You know, it's Walmart, it's Microsoft, every corporation you've ever heard of is there paying their millions of dollars of election money that runs out. So when you hear the Governors Association is funding such and such attack ads, it's not, they don't get the money from $25 contributions. They're getting millions of dollars of corporate money. And we know, you know, maybe the Democrats have better coders. That's about the only difference in, in where the money, you know, the corporate money, you can, I'm sure, have the same list in the Democratic Governors Association or an equivalent list. So corporations are spending a ton of money. Um, that's what we now know. Um, we know they're doing it in even local elections. You may have heard about Chevron spending $1.3 million in a city council race of a th in a community of 100,000 people, Richmond, California. That was in 2012. I talked to the mayor, and she's in the book, Gail McLaughlin, um, actually a green mayor, I believe. Yeah. And uh, she says, and it's now confirmed that corp they're back with $3 million in this year's city council race, a community of 100,000 people where Chevron runs a dirty, dangerous refinery. The super PAC phenomenon, when the first edition came out, we didn't know, about it. we hadn't had the 2012 election. Um, now we know what Citizens United, the monster it created in the super PACs. But apart from the amount of money, again, it's the source, the narrow amount of where it comes from. Super PACs have 32 donors who, co who contributed hundreds of millions of dollars, adding up to more than all of the donors who gave under $200 to both Obama's campaign and Romney's campaign combined. That was 3.7 million people were able to come up with $200. And remember, most people don't make contributions. Only about 4% of Americans make any contributions politically. So 3.7, which is a million, a small, relatively small number, were able to participate by giving up to $200 to presidential campaigns. Absolutely wiped out and exceeded by 32 donors to super PACs who went beyond that. 
Um, in total, most of the super PAC money, 90 plus percent, came from about 3,000 donors. So what is happening is what my colleague at Free Speech for People, John Boniface, calls the wealth primary, where almost all Americans are excluded from that in our politics. They're not represented, they're not able to participate, and it's a, we're asked to be spectators. So that's a problem of Citizens United that we're showing uh, both in this book and our work across the country. The second problem, as you know, is the corporate, what I call the corporate veto. It's the cor use of corporate constitutional rights in the courts, even if we get a law through that vetoes the law because of this fabricated doctrine of corporate constitutional rights. And you know, there was a time, and there are still some law professors in particular who don't get it. They say, oh, Citizens United didn't, it wasn't about corporate personhood. It was a campaign finance case. It's about the First Amendment. It's not about corporations. Well, we know now that, again, we were correct. Well, no, it's about the, uh, the problem of using corporate constitutional rights to veto our laws that happen to be campaign finance laws, but we know it's other laws. And now, since Citizens United, much, it's more like the Gilded Age, the last time we went through this disastrous experiment. Um, so we have, uh, since Citizens United, have had invalidated laws in the environment, uh, public health struck down state laws regarding pharmaceutical prescription information, privacy information, struck down violation of corporate rights, tobacco cigarette warning labels updated, every country in the world does this, not us, violation of the tobacco companies' rights. As Stephen said, Monsanto not only spends hundreds now, if you add it all up in all the states, millions of dollars to defeat genetically modified food organisms and food labeling, goes into court in Vermont, um, and may well win, as they did before in Vermont, um, in a case I talk about in the book, under a theory of a corporate constitutional right not to speak, so-called, so we're not allowed to know what's in our food as a result of this. We at Free Speech for People are in a case, we're doing amicus briefs up in Seattle, you may have heard, they raised the minimum wage in Seattle to $15 an hour. Uh, you know, there's an article in the Times this morning that in Denmark, fast food workers make $20 an hour uh, because they have a union in part. Um, they make $20 an hour is the lowest amount. Seattle raises the minimum wage to $15 an hour and is sued by corporations claiming that violates not only their free speech rights, free association rights, but their equal protection rights as persons under the Constitution. So that's what we're dealing with, um, and it's why Americans are now saying openly, and it's not like radicals, <laughs> it's the, you know, the Kennebec Journal up in Maine, where my wife's from, very conservative area of Maine, saying we're in a plutocracy. And so how do we fix it? The book talks about a lot of ideas. I just want to talk about the amendment idea, um, because it's working, and because there's some strategic um, thoughts I have, and I only have a minute or two. Uh, so I hope we can come back to this in the conversation. But what, um, what I see is, is a tremendous opportunity and a way we can turn the kind of vicious circle that Stephen mentioned about people checking out not voting. It's a rational decision when you're not, when you're excluded to not pretend to play anymore. Well, we, we're turning this into a virtuous circle of, of self-government and citizenship again with this constitutional amendment process. We're all over the country, 600 cities and towns doing resolutions, 16 states doing resolutions. Montana and Colorado on the same day in 2012 passed by 75, 25 percent a constitutional amendment resolution to overturn Citizens United and I'll just close by talking about the difference between those two resolutions. And Montana very clearly said corporations don't have rights under the Constitution. Those are the rights of natural human beings. And money isn't speech. We need to be able to fix that. Instructed their representatives to, to get the 28th Amendment that reflected that policy out to the states for ratification. Uh, Senator John Tester, partly by saying he would do that, won re-election, introduced the People's Rights Amendment, which takes on corporate constitutional rights shortly thereafter, and signed on to Tom Udall's uh, Democracy for All Amendment, which takes care of the money piece. So those are two different amendments. The We the People Amendment, supported by Move to Amend, and Free Speech for People thinks it's good too and supports it, would combine those two. But Montana did it that way. Colorado didn't have the corporate piece, but in my view, that's okay for now. These resolutions are about encouraging this national conversation, moving the for, forward the 28th Amendment, and showing that we still have what it takes in America to do constitutional amendments. We can do the 28th, we can do the 29th, and we can fix both, we can do them together. We'll see what the end game of this is, but the game 
I think now is bringing every American back in and say, no, we're not going to accept plutocracy. We're not going to accept exclusion as equal citizens. We're coming in the way our predecessors did. That's why it's Amendment 28, not, not, not one. You know, we've done this 27 times before. And so I'll just close with that. The amendments, um, we've almost never done just one. We've actually, every time we've done amendments, they've come in bunches because Americans do what we're doing. They say, and it's often because the Supreme Court, like in Dred Scott, or in a case when they said women don't have the right to vote, say, announce a proposition that most Americans say, no, that's not true, we can't live with that, and we organize and we get an amendment-ready atmosphere, and then we do a bunch of them. So right after the revolution, right after the Constitutional Convention, the people actually said, no, you've done a nice job on the Constitution, guys, but it's not good enough. They did 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights. Um, a year later, a couple of years later, 1795, the Supreme Court decided that bondholders could drag the states into federal court. People once again said, 11th Amendment, no, you, no, wrong. Overturn that Supreme Court decision, the first of seven to overturn Supreme Court decisions. Uh, after the Civil War, again, not just one amendment, 13th, 14th, and 15th, reestablished our promise of democracy. It wasn't ancient history we did in the Progressive Era, guild, last Gilded Age. So the amendments that said we're going to elect senators, the amendment that said we're going to overturn the Supreme Court, women are equal, they are going to have the right to vote, and the Supreme Court struck down the federal income tax, said we don't have the power to do that, the people said yes we do, and did a constitutional amendment. Three amendments, we actually did four if you count prohibition, in ten years. Again, not, not ancient history, 1961 to 1971, we sometimes forget, in our lifetimes, at least some of us older folks, you know, we did we did three amendments, we actually did four again, but three of them were about democracy. We said no more poll taxes. The Supreme Court said nothing wrong with a poll tax that keeps the poor from voting, that keeps African Americans from being able to vote because of the racist application of the poll tax. Nothing wrong with that, said the Supreme Court. Americans said, yeah, there is something wrong with that. We did an amendment to overturn it. We did an amendment to expand the representation of the DC District of Columbia re residents. And we did a constitutional amendment saying 18, 19, and 20 year olds can have a right to vote. Um, men and women who are um, able to be drafted or able to serve are human beings too with a right to vote. Three amendments in 10 years did that. So we can do this too. And I, I look forward to working with David and Stephen and all of you. And um, I know we'll have you know, differences on strategy from time to time, but we are going right for the same goal. And we'll get one amendment, we'll get two amendments, we'll do whatever it takes to win this fight. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Jeff. Um, and we will get a chance to circle back around some of these, these topics before the night is over. Um, at this time, it's my great pleasure to introduce another Move to Amend member for you, uh, Jean Fisher. Jean worked on the staff of the National Treasury Employees Union for 26 years, representing federal employees. Jean became a unionist after several labor, labor history courses that she took while obtaining a PhD in economics, uh, which convinced her that for her at least, trade unions were a lot more interesting than academia. So uh, Jean uh, is here to introduce David Cobb. David Cobb is a lawyer and an engaged citizen. He believes we must use every tool and tactic available to attract, to affect the system excuse me, to attract, to affect the systemic social change we so desperately need and so richly deserve. How has David expressed his beliefs? To give you just a taste, he has sued corporate polluters, lobbied elected officials, run for political office, and been arrested for nonviolent civil disobedience. <laughs> David was born in rural poverty in San Leon, Texas, and he worked as a laborer before going to college. He graduated from the University of Houston Law School in 1993. He had a successful private law practice in Houston for about 10 years, and then he decided to devote himself full-time to making the promise of U.S. democracy a reality. As you heard, he ran for Attorney General of Texas in 2002. He pledged that if elected, he would use the office to revoke the charters of corporations that repeatedly violate health, safety, and environmental laws. 
In 2004, he ran for president of the U.S. on the Green Party ticket, and he championed the Ohio vote recount, which helped expose the flaws of electronic voting systems. David is a principal with the program on corporations, law, and democracy, known as POCLAD, and he serves on the National Planning Committee of the U.S. Social Forum, and of course, on the national leadership team of Move to Amend. Please join me in welcoming David Cobb. Thank you so much, that was so kind. Uh, so, uh, I also want to uh, step into this space and, and just honor and welcome a couple of folks who are here. One, uh, uh, two ladies, one, uh, Chris and Coco Justino, who uh, are supporting Steve, so I want to honor the fact that, that they're here. Uh, I want to recognize my sweetheart, Ruthie Engelke, who I've known in Texas since junior high. And also, uh, Steve Justino uh, pointed out Shamako Noble and the work of Hip Hop Congress. I also saw Mike Word in the house, who is a poet, a spoken word artist, and uh, a member of Regenerative Lifestyles doing cutting edge work. So I just want to welcome those people into the space as well. And, and Nancy. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so here's the thing, y'all. Uh, in just a short amount of time, I think Jeff did a fantastic job, and I'm, I'm, I'm honored uh, that uh, Jeff was my lawyer uh, in the amicus brief. I mean, Democracy Unlimited and Poclad were both on that. But I'm going to keep it real and just cut right to the chase here. The United States Constitution is the supreme law of the land. As a lawyer and as a political philosopher, we have to understand that the Constitution codifies the social contract. It is a description of how our entire legal, political system is supposed to operate. And that document begins with three words. We the people. Those are hallowed words in this country, y'all. We the people, because done correctly, it lifts up and points out that we are supposed to be in charge. We collectively are supposed to be making the decisions, right? And here's the thing. In the, the short way to understand how the constitutional framework is supposed to operate, to understand the civics that we were taught, that we were claimed it was going to, supposed to operate, it goes basically like this. We the people collectively hold all the political power, but we wisely delegate some of our power to our elected representatives and we delegate a certain amount of power. All the power? No. Only enough power for government to perform specific duties around the public policy. And there's going to be debate and discourse over that public policy. And you know what? That's as it should be. There should be rigorous debate over what public policy we want. But I'm going to tell you all something. We've lost something very precious in this country because we've forgotten how to engage in principled political debate and still be agreeable to one another. There's something really problematic where we, we've reduced even political discourse in yelling at one another rather than actually doing the real work of actually grappling together, right? But here's the thing. Whether I like or dislike any law, if it's gone through a legitimate political process, that's the law, right? However, there's something very important. The law, the public policy, can never violate my inherent and alienable rights or yours, or yours, or anybody else's. See, there's something magical about the way the Constitution is supposed to be capturing this idea of private individual rights being honored and respected, but we create a community public, communitarian process by which we make the big picture decisions. Saying it that way, y'all, I get, really, I'm getting goosebumps right now remembering how proud I was to be an American when I was a little boy and I was taught that we stood for liberty, justice, and equality. I was so proud to be an American. And not only that, we were like some great what, shining light on the hill that we were going to guarantee liberty, justice, and equality to the entire world. I was so proud to be an American. And then I grew up and realized I had been lied to. <laughs> but you know what? It wasn't really a lie lie, right? Because I remember, I've got a face and a voice that I can associate that. So instead of calling it a lie, you know the face and the voice that I associate that with? Mrs. Armstrong, she was my fifth grade teacher. And Mrs. Armstrong didn't go to bed at night saying, ah, 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 ah. I can't wait till those children come into my classroom so I can fill their, lives, 
minds full of lies and propaganda about this country. No. Mrs. Armstrong was a public school teacher, and like every public school teacher, she engaged in that profession because she wanted to help cultivate children to become productive members of society. And she, be see, she taught that creation myth because she believed it. And it worked on me, and it worked on my classmates, and I bet it worked on you too because you want to believe it. See, we want and deserve to live in liberty, justice, and equality. And I'm going to do you one better. We deserve it. It's our birthright. And it's, yeah, right? It's our birthright to live in liberty, justice, and equality. And folks, that birthright does not come because we're Americans. It comes because we're human beings. See, I'm going to really push us in this conversation to recognize the toxicity of some sort of American exceptionalism and to actually recognize that what excites us and animates us about the creation myth of this country is because it actually speaks to the human experience. Human beings want and deserve liberty, justice, and equality. Human beings actually should be able to meaningfully participate in making the decisions that affect their lives, and human beings should rest assured that the public cannot get together and violate their constitutional rights. Because let me tell you another thing, friends. The Constitution does not create rights. The Constitution recognizes rights. Those rights are inherent. They are inalienable. Sometimes I like to point out, and y'all don't get it learned, this is just winning one button. For those of you in the back you can't see, I'm pointing at my belly button right now. If you're too shy to check in this public place, please go home, make sure you've got one. Because if you do, you also have constitutional rights, which is to say rights that cannot be violated even by the political process. And so stay with me, this is really important. Because, you see, if any law, local, county, state, or federal, violates your constitutional rights, you ought to be able to go into court and get a, a lawyer to represent you to prove that, because that is an illegitimate exercise of the political process. Your rights are not subject to the political process. And here is the danger of saying that artificial entities creating under the state law chartering process can claim constitutional rights. Because if corporate lawyers can go into court and argue that democratically enacted laws violate corporations' constitutional rights, it means environmental protection laws, worker safety laws, public health laws. There is no law that we the people can pass that we can rest assured. Because here's the thing, again, those laws are political decisions. And a proper political decision is one where we the people are actively participating in the debate and the discourse and shaping it. And when the court turns a political question into a constitutional law question, they just turned us, we the people, from active participants into mere spectators. We're, the, we're allowed to have an opinion, but we can't influence it. And so this notion of corporate constitutional rights is utterly, utterly uh, critical to the conversation. And now I want to go one step even further in my time left, and that is to say the way I've described how the Constitution is supposed to operate, it never actually did. Because before I go one second further waxing poetic about the, the Constitution, I want to remind you that in 1789, when that document was ratified and became the social contract, who was we the people? What were their characteristics, y'all? White, White male, 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 landowners, and the rich. See, here's the thing. It took social movements that were broad and deep and convicted, right? It took mass movements to actually mean all people are people. And I think that we make a mistake if we're not willing to be courageous enough to actually acknowledge that, see, the problem isn't in the framing of how the Constitution is supposed to operate, but the question of who is a legal person from jump was critical, and it was incorrectly applied, right? Incorrectly applied because, frankly, that document did not protect the indigenous human beings who already lived here and were subject to intentional, deliberate genocide. That document did not protect the Africans who were brought at the barrel of a gun in chains and forced to fill this country with slave labor. That document actually codified and ratified it. That document did not protect women. It's not just that women couldn't vote. That's a trivial part of it. Women couldn't even own property. Hell, women were 
property by any reasonable understanding of that word. What I'm saying is that document allowed that patriarchal system. That document allowed the exploitation of most of the working class white men. Because most white men in 1789 were indentured servants or second class citizens at best. The point I'm making is I want to have an honest conversation. The concept that I was taught as a child of liberty, justice, and equality and what the Constitution is supposed to be, that is virtuous, and I will fight for that. I will struggle for that. I will make that promise a reality. And I also want to confront with courage and conviction the reality that this country was built upon a racist, sexist, and class oppressive system. And it took social movements to actually make this country more democratic. It took social movements to make this country more fair and more just. And frankly, friends, let's just tell the truth. In this country, we stand on the shoulders of giants. People who went before us and the things that they accomplished make me awed. And I honestly think that my generation, as I look and see what we've accomplished and what we've been willing to do or not do, and I think, you know what? We don't stand very well in comparison so far. We got some work to do. And I'm here to tell you that I have the privilege of traveling around the country to bring you the good news that the work is being done. It's happening. Because in 2009, when I met Jeff Clements on the telephone, and he agreed to, thank you, he agreed to, uh, to allow me to sign off on his good work. Because let me tell you something, I, he was my client, I, I was his client, he did everything. He was just looking for somebody who'd be willing to like say, yeah, that. Well, yeah, that, <laughs> right? And by the way, it's a fine book. Um, uh, and it's a fine brief, and it was excellent legal analysis. And, my friend Steve Justino said some kind words about me in that debate with James Bott. I got to now just tell the truth, y'all. Really what I did was I called Jeff Clement. He sent me an outline, right? <laughs> I mean, I feel like as a trial lawyer, I'm real good at sort of delivering. You know, I, I, got, a, I got a flair for it, but all the intellectual heavy lifting was Jeff Clement. That's, that's, that's a fact. <laughs> but what I'm saying is this. That movement that will bring our generation, and I mean like the last 20, 30, 40 years, into our moment is happening now. And what's amazing is, understood correctly, it's not an issue. It's a principle. The principle of self-government, the principle of democracy. I'm here to tell you there's a democracy movement sweeping the United States of America, and corporate America is working double time to make sure you don't know it. But it's happening. It, when I met Jeff Clements in person, it was actually just at the end of 2009, right? There were 12 of us in the living room. We were talking about whether we would form Move to Men. I'm going to be honest with you. I tried to get that fella to join. Am I right? Yeah. I'm like, hey, you should, you, you should join this effort. Now, you know, he went and, and, and helped co-found Free Speech for People, which I collaborate with and we partner with, right? All I'm saying is it Move to Men as just an organization was an idea. There were 12 of us in a living room. 2010, we launched publicly in response to the Citizens United decision. Tonight, we are 380,000 people and growing every day. Oh, and get this. There are about 120 local affiliates of Move to Men, like the one here at Denver, and we've got it springing up in Fort Collins, and there's one in Boulder, and we're, we got folks on the uh, on the range who we're, we're in conversation with. So 120 local affiliates, and that's not all. We and Free Speech for People and other organizations have helped over 600 communities pass resolutions and support. That's where city council members, you know, or, or county commissioners vote on it, right? 600. That's great, but you know what else? We put it on the ballot 200 times. On the ballot 200 times, this question, how many times y'all think we've won? 200, we haven't lost yet. Think about that, right? By every objective measurement, this movement is getting larger, stronger, and better organized. And here's the other thing. We are now beginning to also do the work of ensuring that Move to Amend is reaching into communities of color where we are working with people from across the ideological spectrum and young people, right? And this is where I want to circle back to Steve's lifting up 
uh, Hip Hop Congress and my friend Shimako Noble and the work that we're doing about actually helping people to understand that this is not just an intellectual exercise, that it touches down into art, into culture, and into every aspect of our lives. The uh, ruling elite are stealing our sacred right to self-government. And what pisses me off as a lawyer is now they're using the legal system to legalize the theft. And they're telling us that we have to put up with it. Where I'm here to tell you, we don't have to put up with it. In fact, we can do what people before us have done, which is to educate, to agitate, to organize, and we can build a movement that will actually make the promise of democracy a reality and for the first time actually have all the people, all human beings actually recognized. That's something unique. So again, it's a complex thing, but it's also very simple because all of us, I think, can respond to the ideas, the, the virtues of what this is all about, right? Now, Jeff and I have got some tactical disagreements, and, and we'll talk about those, but I really want to make sure that you sense the reality that there is a movement where we are working in common, fellow travelers along the road, and these, that there are more and more of us every single day, and I'm going to conclude by this. We are making the path while we walk and it's working. And frankly, the distance that we've traveled already is nothing short of miraculous, right? And here's the thing. We're going to win because we have to win. If we don't win this fight, we know what comes next, right? The economic crisis, the ecological crisis, the political crisis, the spiritual crisis, all these crises that are actually converging now, we're seeing the ruling elite make a play for our very government now because they have to. We are either going to have a functioning democracy in this country or we're going to see fascism. And I want to bring that word into this conversation because I want us to be anchored in that level of seriousness about what it's going to take and at the end of the day to remember this. The abolitionists won. The women's suffrage movement won. The civil rights movement won. The trade union movement won. And they won because they took ordinary ideas and they did the work to create a mass movement that was broad, deep, conscious, educated, and militant. And by that I mean being willing to disrupt and being willing to force the system to change. And that's our work today. Peace. Thanks, David. Now I know um, how James Bott felt, because, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I, I, I joked with David before we came on, I never would have guessed that he's the grandson of a Baptist minister. <laughs> and I think what we're seeing tonight is the difference between the grandson of a Baptist minister and the great-grandson of a Presbyterian minister. <laughs> so, and, and the difference between a Texas trial lawyer and a Massachusetts trial lawyer. So, uh, so we're both on the same page. We just talk a little differently. That's it. <laughs> so, uh, no, seriously, um, you know, it's always inspiring to hear David because he's he's quite right. What the fight we're in is about something simple, but so incredibly profound, so incredibly difficult. And you know, we talk about the founders of the Constitution, but of course, we know even if you just read the document, let alone the history that David reminded us of is that we're all founders, the people are the founders, that, that what happened in the revolution was a, a promise, an idea, but it was an idea that lit up the world, that and yeah, human beings are all equal because they're born human, and that's what we're trying to deliver on, and it's a long struggle, it has been since the beginning. So, uh, I, I, if I could put a question to David, is that the idea? Yeah, so we'll have a little conversation. I think, you know, we often, uh, prove in the ballot initiatives that David talked about in Montana, we proved it, that Americans are actually together on this for the most part. 75%, 25%, 80% to 20% are, are frequently how these ballot initiatives come out. So we know that conservatives and progressives, Democrats and Republicans, independents of all sorts, want what we want. Um, so I, I guess, David, I, I am always looking for thoughts and ideas about how we hold that consensus of people who don't agree on the policy, 
who don't agree on lots of things, but want to come together and do big things as a people, including this 28th Amendment, um, when there's so much forces and money and uh, political, um, the political party system as it's now framed with the money to divide us, to force us apart. How do we hold those conservatives together with the progressives? How do we um, reach Republicans, Libertarians, who maybe, um, I don't know who's represented out here, but I know it is sometimes difficult to do the cross-partisan work. So do you have thoughts on that and how we can do that better, how we accomplish that? Thanks for the kind words uh, and for the great question. And, you know, look, friends, I travel around the country. I'm on the road about two-thirds of my life giving these presentations. And usually it's at Unitarian congregations or union halls or community centers or places like the Mercury Cafe, uh, right? Uh, but about, well, I'd say three to five percent of the time, it's a John Birch group or a Tea Party group. I mean, it's not that often, but I do give it. And let me tell you something, at the Unitarian Church, I get laughter, I get applause, and you know what? At the Tea Party group, I get laughter and I get applause. Now, I gotta admit that laughter and applause comes in totally different places. <laughs> and this is the thing that I wanna really anchor is that there is a share, see, I, I, don't, I don't use exactly the same language with each group, but I tell the same story, right? There is a way to tell the story of limited government and sovereignty and the principles of self-government in a way that every principal conservative will cheer and understand. There's no doubt about it. And so when I am talking to crowds that I know are conservative, I always try to say, look, if you're looking for disagreement with me, we will find it very quickly and we'll find it on policy issues. But I'm gonna ask, can we please see if there is agreement on the principles of self-government and the constitutional framework of how those political decisions are made? Not what the decisions will be, but the framework and the principles of self-government. And it's back to my comments earlier, right, that there's going to be legitimate disagreement on political issues, but the principles of self-government. And I'll tell you, Jeff, I have rarely come across a principal conservative that I can't find common ground when I do that. Right? And the second thing is, you can't take me to a pool hall or a bowling alley where I can't back, go up uh, to the bar and basically get some agreement real quick that the boss man's boots on our neck and that we're getting kicked around and pushed around and it ain't right. And let me tell you something, there is a fierce anger, a populist anger about this consolidation of wealth and power in this country. Because I, like, like y'all have been told constantly that there's a budget crisis in Colorado, right? It's a lie, there's no budget crisis, it's an allocation crisis. Y'all have produced more wealth in this state than, like, like it's amazing, right? It's just getting sucked up. And ordinary working class people, whether they're a Democrat or a Republican, a Libertarian or a Green, they know that. That's where our common ground is. And if you have any comments or questions. Listen, uh, yeah, and thank you for that. Because the thing is, Jeff is all, already, they've done a great job of actually reaching out to conservatives. So mine is actually going to be a setup question, I think. And that is this, Jeff. I'm wondering, would you join me on a nationwide uh, radio program to actually go to Move to Men people and parse out why it is that unions and nonprofit organizations don't have constitutional rights? And I guess the, the, the first question should be, do they have constitutional rights? And if not, why not? Um, thanks, David. Another another great um, question. The answer is absolutely yes. I'd be delighted to do that. Um, and um, let me just say on the, on the cross-partisan point, I, I quite agree and I find I, I've been all over the country too. Something like 29 states, 30 states since this started. I find the same thing. Um, Americans come together on this. They, they, we get it um, and we want to fix it. Uh, but it is a different conversation, a different kind of work and you know, a free speech for people. If you're looking for tools for your uh, Republican friends, uh, or the other way, for your Democratic friends, we've got some. Uh, but particularly on the Republican side, because the media, the corporate media, loves to frame this as, oh, you know, Democrats and liberals want to do the constitutional amendment, and Republicans are against it. They say that even though, you know, 75% of 
Montanans who voted for Mitt Romney for president voted for a constitutional amendment. Um, they say it even though we keep showing and proving, no, that's a lie. 80% of Americans support the constitutional amendment. So when you get that from folks, feel free to go on our website. We've got something called uh, Across the Aisle. It's a report of Republicans who have worked in the states to support the constitutional amendment, who have voted for it in legislatures around the, in the states that have passed resolutions, um, and who have spoken out about it. And some of them or like John McCain, you know, who's called Citizens United the worst decision of the Supreme Court ever, perhaps. And Barry Goldwater, believe it or not, was for uh, campaign finance uh, laws and said corporations and unions, he said, have no place spending money in elections. So we need to all work and, and use these tools to help um, hold us together because they will try to divide us, I promise you that, and they are trying that. So we need to push back on that. The question David asked, uh, <laughs> finally, sorry. I, yeah, so the question David asked is a good one because you'll also hear this and you, if you do, um, are doing this work, and you, I'm sure you've heard it before, that, well, corporations, if they don't have rights, you know, the, the, the newspapers are corporations. The New York Times is a corporation. My church is a corporation. Uh, our nonprofit, Free Speech for People, is a corporation. You know, they have to have rights or, you know, the bad things will happen. Uh, you know, freedom of press, freedom of religion. Uh, and it's not true. Um, and so I'm going to be delighted to do this call, but in the meantime, you can go on the Free Speech for People. We have a legal advocacy program in addition to the amendment. We file briefs. We're having a conference at Harvard Law School next month, um, bringing in law professors uh, um, for a somewhat behind closed doors conversation so they can debate this openly and um, among themselves, because part of the problem is the law professors and the legal academy has been AWOL for our generation, I think, as lawyers. You know, we, we studied, you didn't know about corporate constitutional rights in law school. You didn't, it would almost be embarrassing if you thought, you know, and that's part of our work is to say, no, it's mainstream to be worried about corporate constitutional rights. So we're going to be doing that kind of stuff, but the short answers are, those are human rights. Sometimes we use tools for our, for our rights. Sometimes we use, when we exercise our freedom of speech or our freedom of press, we use computer terminals. We walk into buildings that our you know, newspaper might own, or we use a corporate entity under state law, which is another tool. Um, the tools don't have rights for the, all the reasons David said. Um, it doesn't answer all the complicated constitutional questions we'll still have, but the core of that answer is there. The NAACP defended the rights of African Americans against the state of Alabama that tried to crush the NAACP. Supreme Court said the NAACP has standing, a legal word, to make the arguments of the human beings who are members of the NAACP. It's not corporate rights for NAACP Inc. It's human rights. The court can do that. The New York Times, when Samuel Alito tried this trick of saying, well, he, he spoke to the Federal Society, he said, of course Citizens United was the right decision. If we didn't have corporate constitutional rights, the New York Times is a corporation. We couldn't protect the press. Well, the New York Times answered Samuel Alito in an editorial and said, that's not true. Freedom of press is a human right, and it's the function of the press when the New York Times versus Sullivan or other press cases, it's that function of humans engaged in freedom of press that is protected, not the corporate status of the New York Times. So there's just good arguments right back at them. Same with unions and nonprofits. These are human rights that sometimes corporate entities are in the court to make the arguments about the human beings. It's not corporate rights, though. And I look forward to that call. And, would be happy to answer any questions. And there's a book out that has some of this, actually. Uh, so you can uh, get more details here. Oh, well, thanks very much. Uh, you guys, between the two of you, just took two of the questions that I was going to ask, because I was absolutely interested in how we protect the press without the press corporations having uh, constitutional rights. I also was going to ask about the NAACP case for that same reason. So now I'm going to make them up on the fly. Um, one of the things that is in uh, your book, Jeff, that I just uh, have really incorporated into my presentations on Move to Amend, uh, especially when I'm talking to the conservative groups uh, that, that David does, I go and speak to conservative groups as well. It's a much tougher room. Uh, but one of the things I always come back to is uh, your thoughts 
on uh, Ju Justice Rehnquist being a conservative and Justice Powell being a corporatist and how uh, they had different rulings and how their different rulings have affected us. Could you talk a little bit to the people about uh, Justice Rehnquist and Justice Powell? Uh, yeah, I'd be delighted. Um, and. You know, David Cobb was way too kind to give me the credit for his debate. You got to watch it. It's so fun. Uh, he just is magnificent. Um, but the only thing I did do was send along a, um, a paper I'd written for the American Constitution Society because, you know, sometimes people uh, like who argue on the Citizens United side about these money and rights for things like money and corporations call themselves conservatives, but they're not. They're corporatists. And I, so I sent along a to David and said, please feel free to use anything um, uh, from this. But it was a paper about um, Justice Powell, Lewis Powell, who was featured in the book prominently. If you're looking for a villain, he's, he's there. He wrote the Powell memo to the Chamber of Commerce, outlined the whole program for essentially a corporate takeover of our democracy. And uh, this was before he was on the court. He was a lawyer uh, on the boards of cigarette corporations and many other corporations, advisor to the US Chamber of Commerce, and he outlined in the secret memo at the time, it's no longer secret, uh, how the chamber and other corporate groups using lots of corporate money for as long as it took could essentially do what he said, use activist-minded Supreme Court justices to transform the social, legal, and economic uh, arrangements in America. Um, it's a paraphrase, but not quite. I mean, it's almost exactly those words. He was then appointed to the Supreme Court the same day as someone who was called and is conservative, who's now passed away, Justice William Rehnquist, appointed by Richard Nixon the same day. Lewis Powell went on to write four key decisions in the space of about eight years that created the idea of corporate free speech rights that led in a straight line to Citizens United. Uh, many years later. These were in the late 70s, or 1980s, cases striking down environmental laws, striking down a corporate spending on ballot initiatives law in Massachusetts under a theory of corporate constitutional rights. And it's a really interesting story. Five to four decisions, the leader of the fight trying to stop this and warning where this was leading to was William Rehnquist, the conservative justice, dissented in every one of those cases, said in much... Um, less fiery and, 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 and interesting words than David did, but basically the same point, that these are human rights in a republic. If we, lose, if we give them to corporate entities, we flipped things around where the economic now is ruling over the political rather than the other way around. And so he warned over and over again of this. And in fact, it wasn't until he died and another Arizona conservative, Sandra Day O'Connor, went off the court that Chief Justice Roberts and Samuel Alito came on the court and we got Citizens United overturning two of the decisions that Chief Justice Rehnquist helped make sure were slowing down this train wreck of corporate constitutional rights. So uh, it, it, it's an interesting story. Another thing you can offer to your conservative friends uh, or if you are conservative, check it out. There's a big difference between a corporatist and a conservative, uh, and those two justices really symbolize the difference. Yep, absolutely. David, any thoughts on that? I, I think Jeff nailed it, but I have nothing to add. Okay, uh, yeah, that's fantastic, and, and I take that uh, from that book, and it's just a great passage and it's a lot of great ideas. Um, but something that Jeff said uh, about this secret Powell memo and how it... Uh, basically laid out the, concert, the corporatist. See, it's even easy for me to fall into that habit of saying conservative. We have to train ourselves to be careful, careful in our language because what we're talking about is a corporatist uh, takeover of American political system, not conservative. And that's something I wanted to uh, uh, address, and I think I'll address that to David. Uh, there's a, a political philosopher named uh, Sheldon Wolin and Sheldon Wolin uh, has said basically that a corporate coup d'etat has actually already taken place in this country, and he calls it inverted totalitarianism, and that's not like uh, totalitarianism from the 40s where uh, people were in jack boots, goose stepping down uh, the street and putting people in concentration camps, but it's a, a corporatism, a fascism that leaves all of our political 
uh, symbols and structures in place. We still have electoral politics. We still have an independent judiciary. We still have uh, free press and the Constitution. Uh, but all of those structures and symbols are um, uh, for show. And that in reality, uh, a very small group of corporate and moneyed elites uh, are actually making the important decisions that govern our lives behind the scenes. I'm wondering whether you uh, agree with Wollin's assessment, if you think we're already there, do you think that we're headed in that direction, uh, and if we're already there, what really can we do to change things? Well, thank you, Steve. So uh, I'm going to take that head on because uh, I think that the the structures, like we have some structures available. We should use every tool in the toolbox, right? I mean, it, it did make me happy whenever the, the it, during the introduction that Jane gave that, uh, you know, when, when it was announced that I had been arrested for nonviolent civil disobedience that I got a little splattering of applause there because it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm proud of that, right? I, I am proud of that. And uh, not out of some testosterone kind of thing, but because I really am willing to put my body on the line whenever it makes sense, right? And I say that entering into the conversation to really say, look, I vote, right? And I hope you do too. And I hope you encourage other people to vote. We've got to be willing to vote. We've got to vote. And I want to say this very bluntly. If you want systemic change and all you ever do is go and pull a lever every two to four years, honestly, y'all, you're wasting your time. But there's a corollary to that. If you want systemic change and you don't take the opportunity to vote for candidates who are going to champion that systemic change, you're wasting an opportunity. Right? So we've got to actually break out of this idea that either we do direct action or we do voting. Or you, you do deep education or you do civic engagement. So I think that we have to do everything. And part of the reason that we have to do everything is because the crisis is so acute. And I want to be very candid here. Like, I, I, I look at it this way. Principled liberals have been sold out and lied to by the uber-ruling elite of the Democratic Party who are basically taking their marching orders from the corporations and Wall Street America and the big bankers. And you know what? There is a corollary to that. And that is that principled conservatives have been lied to and sold out by the ruling elite of the Republican Party who are taking money from the same corporations, the same Wall Street America. And it circles back to this, Jeff's exhortation to us to be willing to talk to principled conservatives and find the common ground. Because these days, the conversation and the real debate ain't left versus right, it's up versus down. Right? That's the real fight that's going on today. And honestly, y'all, it sickens me and not like, it, I mean, it hurts my heart whenever there are these fierce debates between principal liberals and principal conservatives that are heartfelt over particular issues, but the reality is we ain't got no opportunity to actually influence it anyway. We're having this debate, but the ruling elite are actually in charge. And I gotta tell you something, I will be honest with you, those debates often happen at Thanksgiving at my family. <laughs> right? I mean, I'm be just I'm keep it real here. Like, you know, I am engaged in this grappling and I've figured out a way to actually find common ground with some of those sort of people. So here's the thing. We've got to acknowledge that there is, in fact, a plutocracy in this country, the rule by a wealthy elite. Right? In fact, a, a, there's a recent academic study that came out from Northwestern University and Yale University professors that actually proved what every... It, you can go to a pool hall at a bowling alley and already know, but now we've got academics telling us that there is actually a ruling elite in this country, and they're in control, and our ability to influence it by elections is actually very small. But let me tell you something, friends. It's still there. We have got to be willing to use the ballot box, and we've got to be willing to engage in art and culture to inspire people, and we've got to be willing uh, to engage in deep education about history and where we've been and where we're going and what the possibilities are, and we've got to be willing to create alternative institutions. Again, I mentioned Mike Word earlier, but the regenerative lifestyles that, that, that is going on, I mean, community-supported agriculture, alternative building practices, credit unions, cooperatives, I mean, all of these things, we, here's what I think. I think that we have to be willing to engage 
simultaneously in fighting harms, abuses, and exploitation every time it presents itself. But just fighting harms doesn't actually get us to a new world. We've also, as we fight those harms, have also got to be creating new alternative institutions that can show that we can get our needs met without exploiting and oppressing each other. That we can actually create cooperative ventures that are communitarian and are loving. And I'm going to actually bring this concept into the conversation. Love and compassion ought to be part of political dialogue. We ought to be willing to talk about it that way, right? Because that's what will actually inspire people. And we've got to actually then, the third thing is to inspire people to recognize that we need to create new institutions, not just one at a time, but ultimately we've got to actually have a new social contract. We've got to actually have a new social, political, and economic institution that will actually reflect the principles of love and compassion. And the last thing that I really want to anchor is something that, again, my friend Shimako has helped me to really come to understand and have the courage to talk about love in a political context. It's not just that the corporatists are stealing our sacred right to self-government. They're trying to steal our ability to imagine a world based on love and compassion. And we've got to fight to claim that. We've got to fight to claim our own humanity. And whenever we do that, all of a sudden, these trivial differences between a D and an R next to your name begin to sort of fade away into irrelevance. So that's what I think. And Jeff, what do you think about Rome's assessment, and what can we do? Um, and, you know, first I'll say I'm glad David brought love into the conversation because, you know, my publisher, um, I'm going to get circled back and you'll see why I'm saying this, but my publisher is a, a B Corporation, a certified B Corporation. It's one of the good reforms I think we need where you can hardwire better practices into corporations. Um, and they have this, uh, they're, they're really good in lots of ways. It's Barrett Kohler up in San Francisco. And they, uh, one of the things they do is they send the manuscript out to four, five, six, you know, peer review kind of stuff, um, which not a lot of publishers do anymore. Um, and so it goes through this process where you get feedback. And one of my favorite chapters in writing the book is entitled Corporations Can't Love. <laughs> and I think it's chapter seven for those of you who want to jump to the fun stuff in my view. Um, and it was for that very reason that really love is at the heart of you know civil society and this crazy enterprise that we started, you know, 200 plus years ago that we're going to be a self-governing republic of free human beings. Um, and uh, one of the feedback from one of the reviewers in the manuscript said, "What's this chapter seven love stuff?" And I'm like, "That's got to go." <laughs> I said, "No way, that's staying. So <laughs> that's still in there." Um, so um, the question, the question was about, you know, I, I, as I said, I, I, I don't know um, how, what kind of labels we want to put on it. You know, uh, frankly, totalitarian doesn't help but sum it up for me horrible images that I um, hope we're not at and never will be um, from the mid 20th century um, when millions and millions died um, under experiments of totalitarianism. Uh, but as I said, um, you know, I agree with what David said about the, the crisis that we face. Um, I agree with the word plutocracy. I, as I said, I alluded to, I think, but I was, I was um, speaking in central Maine, as I mentioned, um, and it's kind of a conservative place, and I was, I, you know, one of the lines I use is uh, plutocracy and that study that David mentioned. Um, and um, I was wondering, can I use plutocracy in a conservative central Maine town? And that morning I opened the, the Kennebec Journal, which is an old... Um, newspaper in, uh, out of Waterville and Augusta, Maine area, and I turned to the editorial page to kind of get the flavor of what's going on, and, um, and I'm reading, uh, they have an editorial about money and politics, and they, they, in the editorial they're saying um, that uh, the same people and corporations who benefit from the current economic policies are the same who, the same very few people who are in um, empowered by the Citizens United decision to prevent any change from ever happening. And then they said this, they said, there is a word for government of the wealthy few, plutocracy. So this is a conservative editorial. So again, I think it's sort of like, um, whether it's the philosopher or whether it's the study, the academic study that David mentioned, is 
you know, the academics are kind of getting around to what every American is willing to say openly, that this ain't democracy, and we got to get it back. Um, so that's what we're working on, and we are going to get it back. I know we will. Yep, I'm glad that word has entered the lexicon as well. Um, we're now going to open up the, question, the floor for questions. We do have Ken Blakesley, who has signed up for, uh, uh, to ask a question. So if Ken, if you're still here and you want to come up, please do. Uh, otherwise, if anybody else has questions that they'd like to ask, please come on up. You could ask from right here, sure. You know, before we get away, Ken, uh, I want to uh, ask, hey, Steve, what did I charge you to come here today? Nothing. Uh, Jeff, what did you charge? And I also want to say, zip, zip, yeah, nada, nothing. Uh, Jeff Book, I want y'all to understand that, that the sales of the book today, you're actually donating it to the movement, right? I'm going to put a check in a, in a box. I hope it's going to be a box. Yes, and so here's the thing. So he's going to put, so please make sure he's going to stick around and sign it afterwards, right? But here's the other thing I'm going to do, y'all. Like, in my tradition, my grandfather, we would call this entire program a free will gift. This is a gift to you, and we hope that it's nourishing to you. We hope it's inspiring to you. But you know what? We still like to eat. And, uh, and so, you know, what we're going to do is a free will gift offering, and I think Rick is going to come up with a, with a, a donation, and we're going to pass it around. And if you are inspired to make a donation, please do. If you don't want to, don't. I want to be very clear, right? Like, please don't leave just because we're passing around a little hat, right? I mean, but we are going to just pass this around and ask for a donation to the movement because believe it or not, the corporations are not funding this movement. <laughs> right? And honestly, the ruler, the, the wealthy, uh, a few, uh, are, like, are inspired, but most of the ruling elite like it just fine too. Ordinary people are actually building this movement. And the second thing, I, my, my sweetheart Ruthie, it, as actually, we, we, technology's so crazy now, we can take a credit card. So if you, Ruthie is over there in the corner, you want to wave like that? If any of you are inspired, you don't have a, 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 a checkbook with you, you can write a check to move to men. Or if you don't have uh, cash with you, uh, we'll th a credit card uh, is available. And so here's the thing. I will, don't give till it hurts, because I hate when I hear that. I hope nobody hurts. And don't give till it feels good, because I hope you already feel good, right? <laughs> and that giving or getting money is not what makes you feel good or not good. But I will say, as that comes around, please give till it feels right. And only you know how much that is. So thanks for allowing me to make that pitch. Thanks, David. And also did want to uh, recognize that uh, the Mercury is donating this space to us tonight. So thank thanks you, very much. Thank you. Ken? Ken, come on up and ask your question. Well, this is more of a comment than a question, or I'd like your response to it, is uh, uh, the word uh, corpaganda for corporate propaganda, C-O-R-P-A-G-A-N-D-A. -A -A. I hope it catches on. It's corpaganda. If, if it is, it is. Uh, and the other one is uh, a word to rival corporation, and that would be a cooperation instead of a cooperative. A cooperation is cooperative. So the corpor a cooperation will rival a corporation, uh, ideally, in time. And uh, the other thing is bottom line feeding in terms of the worst of corporations, where that's the only uh, measure of their, uh, their worth is how much profit they make. And that's essentially it. Thank you. And I, I love your lawyerly uh, articulation. It's good. I like Amen. It. Amen. Amen. Yes. All right. And does anybody else have a question or comment they'd like to make? Well, oh, please Here we go. come on up. The mic, the mic to the stage. I hopefully should be working. Work? Okay. So um, our representatives and senators have been pretty unresponsive to Amendment 65 in Colorado. Uh, we have Senators Udall and Bennett who did move forward on resolution. Um, in the Senate, but in our House we only have Representative Perlmutter who has done anything. And the rest, both Democrat and Republican, have refused to say anything. What would be your tactic to engage them further in this discussion, being that it did pass 74% in all of Colorado. Every county had a majority. What would you do? So I, I, you know, I'm from Texas. If y'all didn't pick up on that yet, 
Uh, it, there's a famous Texas politician named Sam Rayburn. Sam Rayburn once said, you know, as an elected official, when I feel the heat, I always see the light. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you all something, friends. We have not done a very good job of generating much political heat on the progressive side these days. You know, we, we haven't actually taken ourselves seriously. So I think that we're in the early stages of this movement, right? We are going to win. There's no doubt. I am absolutely convinced that we're going to win uh, an amendment to the United States Constitution. Uh, and I'm equally convinced it's not going to come easy and it's not going to come quickly. So my thing is this. I spend a lot less time worrying about lobbying existing elected officials as I do building a mass movement that is so large and so powerful and so pervasive that we're no longer chasing them, we're forcing them to react to our movement. Because one thing I do know as an organizer, whenever I want to try to get uh, an elected official to do anything, if you really want to get them to move, build a parade and they'll break their neck to get in front of it. <laughs> So I think that the, the so I, I'm going to leave it to Jeff how to actually, if he's got any thoughts about how to deal with existing elected officials, but I can tell you this, our effort at Move to Amend is actually to, to recognize that the members of Congress who are going to propose the We the People Amendment are not yet in Congress, but they are already born. And they're probably already serving in state legislatures, and they may be serving in county commissioners or city councils. In other words, we've got to find those genuine champions and give them the support that they need, the inspiration that they need, and build the parade that they can feel comfortable that they're going to be representing. That's how I think. Yeah, I think you know, that's, all, that's all important. And as, as David said before, we need to do everything. And, and one of the everything things is, when we get a win, like a resolution, is, is we don't just call it a win and be done. Um, so I think the questioner is quite right to say the people of Colorado spoke very loudly with Amendment 65. And so what is, what is wrong? Why isn't uh, every representative jumping in front of that parade? And I think the, what I'd suggest is it's a different answer for each of them uh, because it's not a national organization asking them to vote a certain way. To um, It is their people in their districts. And maybe it's not people who've been involved in Free Speech for People or Move to Amend or anything yet, but their constituents just, you know, voted 75%. So I would, I would think if, you know, you got a Republican, you want to get some Republicans from that person's district to join you in a meeting, and you might need to persuade them about, um, you know, what the meeting's about and, and, you know, how we can persuade this Republican congressman to do something that's hard uh, for, you know, if he's going to buck the national Republican position, which is not the same as the Republicans in America. It's the National Party trying to stop this amendment movement and stop reform. But many Republicans are with us on this, so get some Republicans to join a meeting um, and present the resolution, present the resolutions from the communities in that district, and if there aren't any, organize some resolutions in the communities in that person's district. If it's another party, or, you know, find out locally who has influence with the, that representative and, and, and talk to them. Maybe it's a business person, maybe it's faith leaders. You know, the reason we get 75, 80% is because all folks speak out and say we need to do this. You get faith leaders, you get business people, you get conservatives, you get uh, progressives. So when you're trying to persuade a, a representative to do what the people have asked them to do, that's not necessarily you know, the, the, the core, you know, most activist people who are going to be the most persuasive to that particular representative. So I, I think strategically, look at the district, look who that representative um, got elected by, who listens to, and start conversations in the district that are the kind of conversations we've been talking about. They're on basic principles. They're not about policy. They're not fights about left versus right. They're about that reason why 75, 80% are voted for the resolution, and get them to go and send letters and do all the traditional methods of trying to persuade a representative to do what the people want. And that takes some work and time, so it, you can't do it all at once, but I would... Um, 
urge you to keep doing it, and, and that it may be different in different districts. But, uh, you know, there's some more ideas in the book as well. I think websites, you can download resolutions and things like that, of course, and, and do some of that groundwork that maybe can persuade. And remember, if it doesn't persuade them, it forces them to answer out loud what they don't want to say is they're going to they're going to defend the current system. They're going to defend Citizens United. They're going to say to people in their district, no, I won't do what you want. Well, they may not have their job long if they have to say it out loud. Um, so that's that work is really worth doing, whether you think you can persuade that um, particular representative or not. What you're doing in that process is also bringing people together on this issue that will get the Congress, that will get this amendment out two-thirds eventually. And that's probably a good segue for, for me to tell you what move, Colorado moved to amend and Metro, moved, uh, Metro Denver moved to amend are doing along those lines. It's great to hear uh, what Jeff and David had to say because that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, we have a, a committee called the Pledge to Amend Committee and Pledge to Amend Committee has sent multiple letters to every single person running for your federal delegation here in Colorado asking them to commit to uh, pledging to support the We the People Amendment. And we have not gotten a response from any sitting member of our congressional delegation, Democratic or Republican. Uh, we have gotten some pledges of support, however, from candidates. Uh, Vic Myers in CD4 is a supporter of Move to Amend. Uh, if you live in CD4, please consider Vic. Uh, General Irv Halter in CD5 has pledged to support the We the People Amendment, uh, as has uh, Abel Tapia out in CD3 on the Western Slope. So there are candidates out there for you to vote for, uh, and I would suggest that you should if this is an important issue to you. On, at the governor's level, the only pledge of support we have is from uh, Green Party candidate Harry Hempy. So you should all consider uh, giving Harry your support in, in his race for governor. We do those kinds of things as uh, Metro Denver moved to amend. We set up meetings with state and federal legislators and we bring people from their districts into their office and we sit down and we talk to them about the need for amending the Constitution to say corporations are not people and money is not speech. And at this point, uh, they have all listened politely and nodded, um, but um, we haven't been kicked out of any offices yet either. So uh, we, we consider that a plus. So uh, as we send you out into the night tonight, thank you very much for coming. If you like the idea of Move to Amend and you want to uh, get involved in Metro Denver Move to Amend, uh, we have a very active affiliate here in Denver. We meet the third Tuesday of every month at the Unitarian Universalist Church at 14th and Lafayette. We would love to have you come out and, and have you put your shoulder to the wheel and help us make this happen because we all know that it does need to happen and it's going to take all of us to do it. So thank you all very much for coming. Thanks for your rapt attention. Thank you to David. Thank you to Jeff. Thank you to Marilyn and the Mercury. Have a very good night, folks. Absolutely. And, and Jeff will be here signing his book. Uh, so if you have a copy, I saw some people bring the original uh, version in. I'm sure he'll, uh, but I'm sure he'll sign the old one as well. So thank you so much for your time.